Hello and welcome to season two of Dialogue, a true crime conversation. I'm your host, Rebecca Sebastian, and I've missed you. I'm so glad we're back with season two. I've missed putting new episodes out, but trust me when I tell you I've been working really hard behind the scenes to prepare for this season. And there's a lot in store that I'm excited to share. One of those things is that I'm going to be putting episodes out in small series. So we're gonna stay in season two. Nothing's gonna change for you, by the way. You just show up, you just subscribe to Dialogue. Wednesday mornings, there'll be a new episode. But for me, I'm grouping things together when I can by theme. So I'm excited because we're launching September with new episodes and these themes for this month will be justice and injustice okay and i couldn't decide on if it was going to be justice or injustice and i'm just going with justice slash injustice because honestly the two bump elbows a lot they rub up against each other um they're blurry sometimes an injustice happens and there is a just ending and and sometimes there isn't so i decided both words apply so the next four episodes you're going to hear are around this topic and today's is just, I mean, we're, we're coming out strong out the gate. Today's interview is with power couple David Rudolph and Sonia Pfeiffer. Now, David, of course, we mostly know from his work defending Michael Peterson, and Sonia is an award-winning journalist and an accomplished lawyer in her own right who is also married to David Rudolph. Now, they have joined forces to highlight cases of wrongful convictions in their amazing new podcast, Abuse of Power. We're going to hear that trailer right now. I'm a prisoner currently incarcerated in the Michigan Department of Corrections. I'm serving time for a homicide and robbery I did not commit. And I've been incarcerated now going on 31 years. The United States imprisons more people than any other country in the world. It is estimated that tens of thousands of these prisoners are behind bars because of wrongful convictions. Throughout all those years, I wondered how the hell did I get in this situation? What did I do so wrong that I would be even put in this situation? This is Abuse of Power, a new podcast that examines the impact of wrongful convictions and the ways the United States legal system has been used to take advantage of the very people that it's supposed to protect. I'm Sonia Pfeiffer, award-winning journalist and criminal defense attorney, and I'm joined by my husband and law partner, David Rudolph. I represented Michael Peterson in the murder trial that became the Netflix documentary, The Staircase. Together, we've dedicated our careers to fighting the injustices that land innocent people in prison every single year. We're teaming up with the producers behind Netflix's The Innocent Man to bring these stories to you. He said, I know that you're lying and you just need to confess. The state does not want to admit that they executed an innocent man. What do I think about the cops now? They're not on my side and they're not here to help me. From coerced false confessions to threatening witnesses to the intentional withholding of critical evidence will reveal the frightening ways innocent people can find themselves wrongfully convicted, imprisoned, and even executed. There's no way to describe the pain, the anger, the disbelief that somebody would, would take my life in their hands and just lie. Abuse of Power is a Campfire production in association with Acast Studios, Such Content, and Gramercy Media. It's produced in collaboration with the team at Gilded Audio. Listen and subscribe anywhere you get your podcasts. So good. I love this podcast and I loved talking with them. They are deep thinkers, incredibly kind whip smart, of course, and they really care. And I think you're going to feel that on the other end of this episode as you listen, how much they care. So I would ask that you put aside your feelings on Michael Peterson's guilt or innocence. Just for this hour, we can resume and pick that conversation back up later. But instead, think about the larger themes at play in our criminal justice system that David and Sonia are just uniquely qualified at talking about addressing and thinking through on a pretty deep level. 
and they gave me a lot to think about and I so enjoyed killing the small talk with them and I really think you will too. So without further ado, let's start this season two Justice in Justice series with David Rudolph and Sonia Pfeiffer. David and Sonia, thank you so much for being on Dialogue, a true crime conversation. Thanks for having us. Yeah, we appreciate it. Yeah, likewise. Well, I think you're both uniquely positioned to talk about not just true crime, but the criminal justice system, law, uh, and kind of what's going on in our country right now. And your new podcast is kind of how this all transpired. Uh, David, you're a bit of a true crime icon. I don't know if you appreciate that title I'm not, or not. I'm, not, I'm not sure I would label myself an icon but I appreciate it and I he, think he wouldn't ask you not to label him that <laughs> yeah no I mean he's like I didn't make it up but if people are saying it um it's definitely what people say and so you are not new to um people who are paying attention to things like big cases Michael Peterson's being one of the the big 10 as I call them but, uh, but you guys are here because you're both podcasters now and you're podcasting together. So I want to talk a lot about Abuse of Power, your show. But first, maybe, Sonia, you could introduce yourself. People might not know your story as much. So maybe we could start with you and your work and how you got to be podcasting with your husband, David. Sure. I'm happy to be the one who gets to go first. That's nice. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so thanks. Well, I came to the law by way of journalism. I was a television news reporter and anchor for 12 years, and I did a lot of investigative reporting. And in the early 2000s, there was a shift in the way local television news um, was covered, was appreciated. And really, I think there's a simple explanation was that there were a lot of local news stations that became part of larger corporations who really focused on the bottom line and um, what that meant is they wanted advertisers and advertisers pay for the number one TV station. That's the biggest price for ads. And they wanted to figure out, well, what do our viewers want? And so they'd hire consultants and consultants came into a, a local area, let's just say Omaha, Nebraska, for instance. And they'd come from the outside and they would do these questionnaires of the viewing public. And the questions would be, something like, if you only had five minutes to watch your local news, what would be most important to you? And then you'd have a series of answers to choose from. Well, that's a vastly different question than what is most important to you in local news. If you only gave me five minutes, yeah, I would want to know about crime, traffic, and weather. And so what happened is that kind of became the mantra for local news. And I was feeling as though it was a real opportunity to tell important stories and be eyes and ears on the ground in a community um, that was really sort of wasted and uh, I because I did a lot of investigative reporting I dealt with lawyers I dealt with uh, criminal cases in the courthouse quite a bit and in 2001 I was in North Carolina working for uh, the ABC affiliate in the triangle and I was assigned to work on the Peterson case and as I covered that case and it was one of those everybody covered it at the time it was before you had all of the 24-hour news cycles and you had Court TV and you had um, all sorts of national media covering things from jury selection to verdict and you couldn't miss a story. So as I covered the case and watched the lawyers do their job from soup to nuts, I mean, the most boring motions and hearings, I was actually like, this is pretty interesting. And I started to think to myself, hey, if I got a law degree, I could focus on legal reporting. I could cover this stuff. I could get into it. And I'd know a lot more if I was actually um, a lawyer, had a law degree. So I got into law school. I continued to report an anchor while I was in law school, but very quickly I changed my mind about being a uh, legal reporter and recognized that the important place to tell stories was in the courtroom. I did things wow. like the Innocence Project at my at my school. There was a, a public defender mentor project. And I, I, I noticed that there were lots of voices um, who weren't being heard in the system. And I felt that with my skills and my ability as a reporter, I could help them with their stories. And I decided to be a public defender. So that's how I came to the law. And, and really as a, a, a lawyer who had previously reported on criminal cases, it was interesting for me to better recognize some of what I, I think was irresponsible reporting, or at least 
reporting that wasn't fully informed. You know, when you are a reporter, you're always looking for the scoop, you're looking for the big story. Well, you might be reporting on something that a lawyer spent months working to keep out of the courtroom. And then when you go on the nightly news <laughs> and you tell everybody about it, and it happens to be a case where there's you know, no sequestration of the jurors, you know, you, you're really doing a disservice when it comes to the fairness of the criminal justice system. So that's how I came to the law. Um, and then you, the you suddenly realize that <laughs> you certainly didn't realize that during the Peterson trial. I was a reporter. <laughs> I was a lawyer. <laughs> we, yeah, well, he, we will I, get I there. He's, he, yeah, he's looking for some storytelling here. And I'll go ahead and rip the bandaid no, off. No, you, no, no. How you yelled at me on my way home from the six o'clock news. You I mean, it's a great story. Yeah, I mean, so you were perceiving him in his job, in his element, in one of the biggest cases in our country before you were married or knew yeah. him personally, right? Oh, yeah. So how, <laughs> how, what a, what a unique, <laughs> what a unique story. Yeah, tell, tell, what was that like? I mean, was your reporting of him critical? Was it? No, um, no, 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 it wasn't critical of me. It was, it was more, you know, sort of her picking up on these facts that I was desperately trying to keep out of the jury room. Oh, so she was just good. She was just really Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I was. Look, this is, here's the truth. If you're a good reporter, you're going to tick off people on both sides. And yeah. I, I, I was a good reporter. And I did tick off both sides in that case and in other cases I covered. And, you know, when I say it was irresponsible, I say that from the standpoint now as a criminal defense attorney. That's yeah. music in my ears. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the first time you've heard it. Um, but, yeah, no, I mean, when I covered that case, I certainly got an appreciation for the level of dedication and hard work um, that is required in, in any case, really. Um, but yeah, I think it's fair to say that David was not a fan of Sonia Pfeiffer during <laughs> well, no, there were certain times I wasn't. There were other times where you broke very good stories. So no, I Yeah, that's when the prosecution was upset with Well, me. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> she was taking it on on all sides. Yeah. You're you're actually touching on a theme that I thought might come up a little later and I still want to do like some background stuff, but while we're here, I'm just going to ask you both, you know, in terms of coverage because crime news is so important to people how does it impact you know the insides of a courtroom so not only is it just reporting now it's there's entire podcasts and documentaries that live on well beyond the life of the case in the courtroom so how is that impacting a trial in the moment and then also beyond once it exists after the verdict comes in and, and do you think it's it's a, a good thing or a bad thing or a mixed bag i'd love to hear both of your thoughts on that well let, let me start off um you know i guess uh it's not just the media now it's also you know social media and people commenting on you know twitter and instagram and reddit and all these other places um and you know i think that the real problem is the publicity before the trial okay um, and and that's where I think there needs to be a better balance between First Amendment, you know, free speech on the one hand and due process rights of the defendant on the other. You know, right now in our country, uh, whenever those two uh, principles clash, uh, due process goes out the window and First Amendment wins. Uh, and I can't tell you the number of situations I've been in over my career where I was trying to keep something private uh, because it was going to adversely affect the fairness of the trial and some media lawyer would come in and argue first amendment first amendment first amendment and that would be the end of it so yeah. for me that's where the balance needs to be restruck uh, and i think we need to give greater deference uh, to the due process rights of somebody who's on trial you know whether it's for a few years or whether it's for his life uh, so that's the real problem from my perspective in terms of what's gone on in terms of podcasting and, and documentaries and those sorts of things. I actually think that's generally a good thing if the documentaries and the podcasts are, are true, you know, if they're, if they're informed and fair and true, because what it's doing is educating people about how the criminal justice system really works. And, and that was really one of the reasons why I agreed to let uh, you know the filmmakers film uh, our our case, uh, because I thought that they were interested not so much in the 
drama of the of the facts, but in the process and how the process was going to play out. And I think that's what our documentary does. I think the staircase really gives people an inside look at how the criminal justice system works, and importantly for me, how a defense lawyer does his or her job. Because you know we've been taking it uh, uh, really on on the head for the last thirty years about what we do and why we do it. And the fact of the matter is that what we do is we protect people from abuses of power by people in positions of authority. That's what we do. Uh, and, and it was really important, I think, for people to see that. Uh, it's why I went on a speaking tour afterwards. Uh, and I think it's had that impact on a lot of people. Uh when I go, I'm going back to the word iconic. The staircase is iconic because I think it was the first time. I mean, I remember watching it and thinking like, is it okay that I'm here? Like, do they know they're still rolling? I mean, the access and getting those behind the scene conversations between you and your client uh, are really powerful. And they do, they lift the veil. It's sort of like, this is how the sausage is made, you know? And um, I think that's why people became so enthralled. And what's interesting is that you both have public defender experience, and now you're doing a lot of that work specifically around wrongful convictions. And I think people, correct me if I'm wrong, David, but have this idea of you. We saw you in this very powerful position of being an, a wealthy person's attorney. And so all the perceptions that go along with that, um, you know, for better or for worse. And defense attorneys, whether they, they have a client with all the money in the world for their legal defense or none at all and are appointed one, you have the same job. So can you talk about the differences though? Because there have to be some well, and what it's like. Sure, I mean, there are amazing differences, um, but uh, you know, I think the important point is not that uh, you know, wealthy people get an unfair advantage. The point really should be that indigent people get an unfair disadvantage. Uh, okay, and, and yeah. That's, yeah, that's the way I look at it. Uh, now, you know, keep in mind, I started as a public defender yep. uh, and I, I was a public defender for four years. And then I went to teach for four years and ran a clinical program where students represented people who were indigent. So this was never about money for me. Uh, you know, if I wanted to make a lot of money, I could have been a, a personal injury lawyer uh, and, and retired a long time ago. Uh, so it was never about making money for me. This was always and I think this is true of a lot of criminal defense lawyers it's a calling. I mean, I know that sounds corny, but it really, really, really is true. We actually care about sort of standing between the government and the power of the government and the individual. That's what we care about. It's not the money. Now, you know, have I done well? Sure. You know, I mean, I, I, and, I and I like the fact that I can, I can buy nice things, but that never motivated me. Uh, and it still doesn't motivate me. So how do we write that disadvantage, that clients who get appointed an attorney, uh, you're saying that's a disadvantage more than maybe a client who can afford their own private attorney. How do we start addressing that, that gross imbalance? Because that's most people's reality in our country who find themselves in need of a lawyer. Absolutely. And, and the, the way you start addressing it is by pouring resources into indigent defense. You know, the part of the problem is, you know, I was a public defender. I, I cared every bit as much about my clients there as I did when I went into private practice. The problem was I had a hundred cases at a time. And so I, I had to triage, mm -hmm. you know, I couldn't, I couldn't spend all my energy on a single case. I had to triage in order to, to do the most good for the most people. Right. It shouldn't be that way. You know, there should be public defender offices that are well-funded. There's lots of great young lawyers out there who are really dedicated. And if we just give them the money and the resources, then the playing field will become more level. And, and, and that's, on, that's on us and our government and where we spend our money. Well, and I agree with that, but I think we need to make clear when we're talking about resources, what we're talking about. I don't think that people understand when we say it's sort of like the government versus the individual. 
recognize that a district attorney's office has behind it really an entire police force mm -hmm. and that police force and that district attorney's office are funded before a public defender's office is and so you have all of this ability to marshal resources to put people and attention on cases and that's not to say that there aren't underfunded district attorney offices i think in general people think the criminal justice system needs to be better funded for sure um, but i think if we're talking about funding it needs to be across the board and if you are putting people in a situation where they're being tried for their freedom or for their life why are we not going to provide them with the same level of resources as the other side and i think that's one of the biggest disadvantages it is the number of cases and it's the lack of access to investigators uh, to social workers to the kind of basic needs that your client might have that need to be served before they can even assist in their own case yeah, I am investigating a case um, outside of this podcast for a second show, and I'm working, I'm talking to a, a DNA expert, and the the number of continents now this DNA information has gone to different people to get different opinions, and it's being circulated, and it's approved here and not here. I mean, the resources for that are not uh, nothing. It's, a, it's quite a large investment, and a person's innocence is in the balance. That's what's in the balance, and not everybody is going to be able to have that happen. And that's becoming very, very clear to me. And what you're saying makes total sense. And I know how the reality of it is so difficult to, to start like moving the needle in a different direction. Um, I want to talk about, and I didn't know how quite to frame this, this, uh, this question, but when both sides in a trial are doing their job well and doing it right, it feels like everybody should win, but somebody always has to lose. So can you talk about the ethics of prosecution and the state doing their job well? Because victims have to have an advocate. And I would imagine a lot of prosecutors feel like that's their calling to, to speak up for the voiceless, just like you have yours. And we need that for our rights to be protected. So how does this play out so that there's, do you ever feel like you've won when you've lost or that you've, probably that's the only scenario that it would happen. If you've won, you probably feel like you've won. But do you know what I'm saying? When, when there's no corruption and maybe when everyone's doing their part in the system, participating well, it feels like everyone should win or, or be happy. And yet there's not always an outcome that's pleasing. Well, I think there's a, a few ways to address that question. One okay. is really drawing the lens back and taking a look at the bigger picture. When we're talking about criminal justice and crime, we're talking about situations where there's really never a winner. And so I think that it's hard to even frame it in that way. I think that the fairest trials are the ones that you can look at and say, not only did everybody play by the rules in the trial, but everyone played by the rules getting up to the trial because it's not that a prosecutor is out there trying to do the wrong thing but if a prosecutor doesn't have evidence that they should have or she has some sort of tainted expert witness report and she doesn't know it she's not in a position to play fairly or unfairly she's just playing with the hand she has um, but I think that, you know, there's a simple answer to your one question. Do you feel like you won even when you lose? I think there are definitely times where your client needs a voice and you might lose because you got a guilty verdict, but you won because your client felt as though he or she was heard and they got a fair sentence, <laughs> you know, I mean, we define wins in different ways. I think, yeah. um, but really the problem I think is a systemic one where I don't know that you could always imagine a fair trial when it begins with an uneven playing field. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I wonder about justice and what it looks like when it works and when the system works, who feels there was justice because not everybody always agrees. Well, well I, uh, I think, you know, I've been in some situations where you have a really fair judge and a really scrupulous, honest prosecutor, uh, and you put on the evidence. Uh, and as, as Sonia said, sometimes winning is simply getting the sentence 
that you think your client deserves as opposed to some draconian, you know, uh, sentence uh, that will keep him or her in prison for the rest of their life. Well, right. I mean, we have to talk about sometimes plea deals aren't plea deals at all. And so you're going to go to trial. Now, I think that happens less and less um, because there is this desire to resolve cases. So I think you do see um, plea offers that are attractive, but then you have the problem of an attractive plea offer that may still be something that doesn't reflect the seriousness of the crime. It's just not as bad as it could be. Or you have an innocent person pleading guilty because they're afraid to roll the dice at trial because of what we call the trial penalty. So in that case, an Alford plea would be a good example? An Alford plea is a, is, is one example. I mean, okay. it, it's a fairly unique example in the sense that it, it really is used fairly sparingly. Uh, and it's really only used sort of in those situations where both sides sort of need to save face in some way. Uh, and and everybody wants to resolve the case, but no one's willing to, to give up, if you will. Yep. Um, so that's a unique situation. I think what Sonia is talking about are those situations, and this is the trial penalty that I don't think people really understand very well, at least, you know, out in the community. Uh, and that is, especially in federal court now, uh, if you go to trial and lose, you are literally facing decades in prison. You know, when I started practicing, if someone got a five-year sentence, it was like, whoa, I can't believe he's going away for five years. Now, five, gift. five years is a gift. And so, you know, when, when you know that if you plead guilty, you can get your five years. But if you roll the dice and go to trial and lose, you're going to get 50 years. Yeah. It, it takes a unique individual to say, I don't care. I'm rolling the dice. And, and that's not that's not an exaggeration. Oh no, it's not an exaggeration so, at all. And I I think it's fair to say that you know David stepped away from um, a lot of federal criminal law years ago, state criminal law for that matter too. I was still handling a number of those cases, and you were shocked at some of the realities that oh, my clients it, were facing. Yeah. And and as an attorney who's in that position of feeling as though you are trying to protect the rights of your client, you start feeling incredibly ineffective. You actually, in, in my, what happened to me, <laughs> is feeling as though I was actually a part of the system. I was helping it operate because I was there, not as a potted plant. I think, you know, I, I did a good job. I, I my, my clients felt good about the representation. I probably saved them some time, maybe a couple of years, maybe a few months. But at the end of the day, it didn't feel as though I was really having an impact in a significant way because it was still just unfair. And you were a cog. Right. Not not just the cog, not that, but actually helping the system run. I think that's different. Not I did not feel like it was sort of mill work. I felt like I was there and because I was there, things could proceed because you couldn't proceed without a lawyer. Right. So, um, yeah. And so the, the you were sort of an indispensable ingredient in this Correct. awful system. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, the sentencing seems like a place where major reform is needed. I think about oh, well, people yeah. like Adnan Syed, for example, whose guilt or innocence is, is wildly debated and is a great example of a podcast taking on a life of its own far after a trial. That's something people talk about all the time. Forget his guilt or innocence. To me, he's he's served 20 years. He's my age. He went in so young. I think is that a fair enough time spent even for taking a life, which I, I, I take so seriously. That's such a, a, a massive tragedy for the family that they're still living with. Um, if we were doing a better job at what we did inside the walls of incarceration, could that be enough time for somebody to then be released, save for some few like real exceptional serial killers or something? I don't know. What are your thoughts on this? Oh, I mean, absolutely. I think Look, I think that this question about um, sentencing, about incarceration, is really a societal question about how we treat each other and what we want to create in our society. We teach our children that when you've done something wrong, you get punished, and then you have an opportunity to prove yourself. Yeah. What we teach people who are convicted of a crime is that you are punished and you will be forever punished because the 
you know, collateral consequences go on and on and on. Right. And the sentences are insane. And, and I agree with you that in a, even in the most serious situations where a life is taken, why are we not also taking into account the individual the nature and circumstances of the offense, absolutely. The history and characteristics of the person, that should be just as important. One of the stories that we talk about on our podcast, the Ephraim Paredes Jr. case, that's another one where, you know, guilt or innocence, not sure, but he has proven himself to be an exemplary human being, not an exemplary prisoner, an exemplary human being. And there's no reason why when somebody against all the odds is able to improve themselves and be a benefit to society, why we don't allow them a full return. Um, so I really think it's, it's a larger question of what do we do with the system that's built on, on this incarceration? Um, well, it's all about retribution as opposed to rehabilitation. Right, there, there's yeah. no real rehabilitation. But um, you know, just, just picking up on, on what you said, uh, you know, part of it is recognizing that even when somebody has taken a life, that's not necessarily who they are. Yeah. It's yeah. what they did at a split moment, split second sometime, moment in time. And, you know, my feeling about all that is there, but for the grace of God go I. You know, if I had grown up in their circumstances, surrounded by the kind of drug use and violence and uh, mayhem, uh, and I didn't know how to use my voice and my words uh, if somebody, you know, dissed me, uh, what would I do? Uh, and, and so, you know, these things happen in a split second. You know, it, it's very rare that you have some murder that's thought out, you know, months in advance and planned out and, and it's, you know, particularly cruel and heinous. Okay, I get that. And, and we don't want those people walking the streets. I get that. That's protection. That's not retribution. We, we just need to protect ourselves. But for the normal run of the course, uh, run of the mill crime, generally speaking, it is not, it's a crime of, of opportunity or a crime of passion. It's not a crime of, of deep thought. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think we need to recognize that. Yeah, I had a law enforcement uh, officer on who became a polygraph expert, and he said, and I was very impressed by his humility, given his role in the system, uh, we're all one bad decision away from being the other guy on the other side of the table. That's exactly Absolutely. right. Yep. And that really stayed with me. And and Sonia, something you said is just seeing somebody as a human, you know, they're they're stripped of humanity once they've created that crime, uh, com committed that crime, right? that's just, they're reduced down to one act. And I think about a varying amount of privilege we all sit in, all of us have something different, but given different circumstances and a confluence of unfortunate events, you just don't know. Uh, and that's, that's, that is hard to reconcile with the justice seeker in many of us too. And the wanting someone to pay if we've suffered a loss, like it's very hard to reconcile. I don't suggest that's easy to, to embody that way of thinking, but I understand it. But, you know, keep in mind that what the criminal justice system is supposed to do is not give voice to that feeling of revenge. I mean, we all, you know, if, if somebody hurt my daughter or Sonia, would I want revenge? Absolutely. You know, would I want to see that person hurt as badly as, as the person I love? Absolutely. But the whole idea of the criminal justice system is to take that righteous feeling and channel it into something that is a little less extreme and a little less um, vindictive uh, because, you know, I don't recognize what caused that person to do it, but other people can. And, and so, you know, I think it's, it's really important uh, that we recognize that, that um, people, people are people and, and, you know, we are all one bad decision away from being on the other side. Well, and here's the truth. I mean, when you talk about that scenario, that feeling of wanting revenge and wanting to hurt another person, you know, there are discussions around things like restorative justice. And yes. there are, you know, these opportunities for victims to be able to sit with the person who 
victimized them. And it is incredible what happens when people are given an opportunity to see each other as human beings, to get an apology, to get an explanation, whatever it may be. And that piece, we don't have to remove all of that emotion. Why don't we find a way to deal with that? Why don't we find a way to address it? Then we can handle whatever we need to handle from a punishment standpoint, from a rehabilitation standpoint. You know, those type of um, really victim-centered restorative justice programs are among the most successful in the country. Yes, and I know you spoke about that in your very first episode, which I want to talk about, but you're reminding me about, uh, I don't know if you're familiar, you, you likely are, of what happened in Rwanda post-genocide. And sometimes I think we in America have, have we're like too fortunate to have such a simple solution in a weird way. I think their economy relied on reconciliation because they needed their neighbors and everybody was so connected. So the perpetrators of the most heinous killings you really can do had to go back and ask for forgiveness from the family members of the victims and, and amend and, it was like government sanctioned. And I, when I learned that and when I traveled there and, and met people and heard their stories of, of what that looks like and what comes out of that, it is not easy. It's messy. There's a, like a messy middle. And then I really think what flows out of it is, is truly beautiful and healing and transformative for everybody, a part of it. But they had to do it. I think it was like a practical need as well as probably spiritually motivated. It's a different motivation. We just don't have that. We don't have the need here. It's so much luxury and let them deal with it and just throw them away and forget about it. I, and I think it's, it's a disservice to us almost. Well, you know, I, I think we actually do have the need. We just don't recognize. Correct. The need. You know, I mean, I, I mean, the need is a human need. Uh, we have a lot and, of false things propping us up to, to feel self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. But the need is there. I agree. That's yeah. human. A lot in the way. Yeah, I didn't mean to get into Rwanda. I've never talked about that on the True Crime podcast, but um, no, it's, but it's, it's true. It's true. It's well, look at, look at South Africa. Right. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, no, no, you're exactly right. And I, I think that there really are so many important societal questions that underlie all of what we're talking about yeah. that really come into play in the criminal justice system that you can't ignore if you want to find solutions. And I think yeah. even where we are as a country right now is sort of proving that. And Ooh this, you know, this sense of like, what do we do? I mean, you know, so much of it just begins with education right. and, and, and understanding each other and seeing each other and, and, and not just creating, um, hate. Well, not just that, but you know, scenarios, um, groups of people, but understanding one-on-one, -on -one, these are human beings, real relationships and understanding who our neighbors are in the broadest sense. So I think we have so much work to do before we could get to something like what happened in Rwanda or, or in South Africa, um, because we had just put so many layers of crap between us. Yeah, and I think, gosh, our country is poised and positioned for a moment like that, where honestly, I think a lot of people, uh, mostly I'm speaking of people in the majority, have like some forgiveness to be asking for and then get to the work of, of making changes. So it's a good time to talk about abuse of power, your podcast. I'd love to know um, why you started it and how you select the stories you're going to, to include there. And then specifically your first episode, which I suppose when you were starting out a lot of the national events around uh, police brutality, shootings, Black Lives Matter were happening. So you address it right out the gate, which I loved. Um, but let's talk about abuse of power. You guys came together to work on a podcast. How did it transpire? I'll let you tell the story. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, the purpose of the podcast really is, is like what we were talking about earlier. It's education. It's telling stories that are compelling and, and really enlightening people to what happens within the system so that people are more educated when they serve as jurors, so people are more educated when they consume media. Um, it really is this hope that people will take something away from um, how the system really operates. I mean, how the podcast got underway is that David and Ross Dinnerstein, who is the producer of Innocent Man on Netflix, uh, oh, good the company Campfire, um, they began this little bromance on Twitter. <laughs> like David tweeted something about like an innocent man. And then Ross tweeted back like, oh, hey man, I love Staircase. And they sort of started talking about doing a project together. 
And I, at the time, David was talking with a few people. There was a lot of interest in him doing something, whether it was television. And I'm not sure how Ross learned that I was your law partner and a former reporter, but that seemed to be attractive to him. And it was attractive to us to do something different together. Yeah, well, and, and you know, to be honest, uh, you know, after you do this for a long time, uh, there's a burnout factor. Sure. Uh, and, and you know, after, after uh, the Peterson case, I really sort of transitioned my practice into doing wrongful conviction cases and representing people who had been wrongfully convicted and, and suing the police officers who were responsible uh, for those wrongful convictions. Uh, and that's sort of where my practice went. But, but even that, at some point, uh, it gets to be um, burdensome, you know, just psychologically soul crushing. Uh, and so I think I was in particular looking for not so much retirement, but to, to pivot again, uh, to do something that I felt was still meaningful, but with less stress. Um, you know, I, I had done Although my- Although you realize it's very stressful to, to tape. <laughs> it, it was, well, it's more stressful than I thought it was going to be because <laughs> I'm taping with this professional you know, voice. Yes, you got a good partner there. <laughs> right, and you know, so I, you know, I'm in there, and she's giving, she's saying, "Slow down, slow down." Yeah, you yeah. Know, yeah. Go closer to the mic. Right. Uh, anyway, You're in good hands. Ex exactly. But, well, I don't think he would describe it that way, but thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so you know, for me, it was a chance to to continue, as Sonia put it, the education, uh, and. Uh, you know, part of that is that I think people don't realize that, especially in the criminal justice field, change can come very rapidly from the bottom up. You know, we don't need to worry about what Bob Barr is doing. Well, yes, we do. What well, we do. No, I, I take that back. We do need to worry about what Bill Barr is doing. Bill Barr. Bob Barr. Whatever. Barr. Anyway, we need to worry about him. But, um, but really, for most people, it's the local law enforcement and the local criminal justice system yeah. that impacts their lives. And that's a matter of who is elected DA and on what platform and what are their priorities? What do they think about bail, you know, cash bail? What do they think about, you know, low level uh, nonviolent crimes? Uh, you know, what do they think about, you know, conviction integrity units? Yes. There's all kinds of, of issues uh, that, that can really impact how a criminal justice system works in reality in a local area. Uh, and I don't think we've paid enough attention to that. It, it's starting now, but it, it's still slow. And then the other piece is we also need to pay attention to our local elections. Yeah. You know, the people who serve on, on, city councils and on county commissioners because they control the purse purse, purse strings uh, and and you know if you're going to leverage change uh, one of the ways you leverage it is through money yeah. uh, and through and through funding so we all need to do a better job i think of educating ourselves about what candidates stand for and and thinking about what we care about in our local candidates and and not just limit ourselves to who our senator is going to be or who our governor is going to be or who our president is going to be, although we need a new one. Uh, you know, we, we need to focus locally as well. And I'm hoping that this podcast can help to, to turn some attention to that. Well, and I think that some of those things that you're talking about really unfolded as we did the podcast, as we started to talk about these issues, as this national awakening began, I think we started to realize that having any kind of platform to educate people about these issues was one worth really uh, using well and using responsibly. So, um, and, 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 you know, and frankly, it was fun to do a project together where, um, you know, I got to pull my reporter background into my legal, uh, you know, field. And it was sort of like, Hey, wait, this is why I went to law school. So now I'm kind of bringing this stuff together. Who yeah. knew that we could actually do meaningful work with a law degree? <laughs> there oh, you go. Oh, oh, oh. I mean, sorry, <laughs> let me rephrase that. <laughs> Who knew you could do meaningful media work oh, okay. with a law degree? Sorry, sorry. It's like, consider, consider the room, Sonia. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, no, podcasting seems like a beautiful platform for you in particular with your background in media and reporting. Um, and I really think our country is in a moment where we can maybe start hearing the things you guys are talking about on yours. And I think the true crime genre is expanding a bit to include more topics of criminal justice. That's my hope. And since I started just a year ago, I can't tell you I knew who was my DA or who was voting and when. And now I know it is the most important thing I can do as a citizen and someone who doesn't feel they can affect change. It's so important. That is like my one takeaway. If nothing else happens from my podcast, I'm I'm grateful. Um, I'd like to talk about, since we talked about funds, and that's where a lot of power comes from and a lot of the structures and imbalances, how about police reform and the def the movement to defund? I think there's a lot of confusion around it and a lot of fear. And I closed season one with a wonderful guest who talked from his perspective, and everybody has one. His is not to defund so much as wholesale police reform. And he's an officer of color, uh, an ATF agent, retired now, wrote a book on police brutality, has seen it from a personal level inside the force, even experiencing racism from his fellow colleagues and now outside of it. So he actually thinks they probably need more money to do things better and have more specialized agents working in tandem with patrol officers. How do you guys see it? Um, so that maybe your clients are better treated before they, maybe they don't need you as often or, or how are you guys looking at this? I mean, look, I think that defund the police is an unfortunate um, description. Yeah. I think that it, it's, it, it's become sort of it's a, become it's become it's been used against those who are well intentioned. Yeah, I think that defunding police departments of weapons of terror are is absolutely something that we should do. Yeah, do I yeah. think that police departments need more funding to create meaningful community policing? But more importantly, do I think that there should be an enormous re-education program? A hundred percent. I think if we properly fund law enforcement and we begin by really rolling back to the beginning, I think we could make changes. But, you know, we are where we are. What do you do? I mean, you can't remove a police force and make a community feel safe. No one can rightly argue that. But we do need fundamental changes in the way law enforcement operates. You see time and again, murders of black people. We just saw what, oh I God. mean, I can't even, you know, you, you try not to become numb, but there's almost this need to stop yourself from processing yet another loss of life yeah. in a very callous way where you know, then we start having this debate. Oh, well, did you see what happened before? Oh, do you know what? The it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You know, to shoot a man seven times with his children in the car in the back, in the back is not okay ever. And that wouldn't happen if we had more education. I don't mean to sound Pollyanna-ish about this. I know it makes people want to roll their eyes, but it's true. We have, instead of creating a police force that is a community-based police force that is part of the community. We've essentially created this militia to police its citizens and therefore police the citizens who are the most vulnerable and who have always been the most marginalized because it's really just this continuation of structurally what we deal with in this country. Um, so do I think the police need more funding? Sure. But I think for the right things. Well, they yeah. need different kinds of funding, I think, is, is one way to put it. Or reallocation um, of funding. Yeah, exactly. Move you it. know, I mean, do they do they need tanks? Do they need, you know, AK 47s? Do they, you know, do they need these weapons that are used in the battlefield? No, they don't. Uh, what they do need is training. They need de-escalation uh, instruction. Uh, they need let me just say, I think most wrongful convictions come from confirmation bias. Mm. All right. You know, you can talk about fault, you know, uh, uh, fabricated confessions. You can talk about junk science. You can talk about all these other things. But at the bottom, when you really, you know, dig down, it's always a police officer or a prosecutor who has tunnel vision, who has confirmation bias, 
who is doing whatever he thinks is right, because they're not setting up people they think are innocent. They're setting up people who they think are guilty. The problem is that sometimes they're wrong. Right. Uh, and, and so, you know, if we can just deal with confirmation bias, you know, doctors have to deal with this. They train doctors to deal with confirmation bias. That's why you have differential diagnoses. You know, a doctor, mm-hmm. you don't walk into a doctor and he says, I know what's wrong with you. No, he's got a checklist. He's got a differential diagnosis that he's got to work through in his mind before he says what he thinks or she thinks is the problem. You know, pilots have to be trained. I mean, why are we not training law enforcement and DAs, and for that matter, defense attorneys in confirmation bias so that we're, you know, we're not going to ever lose it. We all suffer from it, but at least we can be aware of it and understand when it might be affecting us. Well, I think it's even broader, though, than confirmation bias sure in television. Is. I think really it is cognitive biases generally. Okay. We have a judge here in Mecklenburg County who um, has spent a lot of time recognizing his own biases and works with a checklist when he has a defendant in front of him to make sure that these things are not impacting the decision he's going to make. Wow. And when it comes to policing, when it comes to how we treat each other as citizens, if we can all begin to really sensitize ourselves to the reality of the world we've all grown up in. And yes, I'm talking about systemic racism. Yes, I'm talking about social injustice. If we can all begin to educate ourselves, we can then always have this mental checklist that doesn't become onerous. It becomes the kind of thing where you are checking yourself the minute you're doing something. It's like anything. I mean, whether it's, you know, whether it's learning to be a good meditator and be conscious of what's happening in your body, or whether it's learning how to be a human being and recognizing that the stories you've been told or the experiences that you've had might be impacting your decision at this moment. And I do think that's the kind of education and training that can and should take place, not only within law enforcement, but within the criminal justice system broadly. Even criminal defense attorneys suffer from this. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. you know, you, this it affects everyone. It, countless cases that you get and you think they're total losers. By the time you go to trial, you're sure you're right. You know, I mean- You think it affects podcast hosts? No. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're exempt. We're, we're exempt. <laughs> um, you know, and I think not only on a professional level, but anecdotally on a personal level, I think I can feel encouragement that that's possible, that I think some people are feeling a little bogged down by the, oh, I don't want to do the wrong thing, say the wrong thing, and reverse this whole way of thinking that I've been used to. But we see our kids and how they're able to do it and how instinctive and and natural and how they embrace it. And so I feel like there are great examples, too, to point to. They're just they're being raised with such a different awareness. And I'm you know, I don't know all of our different ages, but, you know, my daughter tells me what not to do before I go to a march or a demonstration in New York and she's refer to the organizers, don't comment, you know, because it's not, <laughs> it's not about you. And I'm like, oh, that's actually really good advice because of course people are interested in what I want to say. If they're asking me, it'd be rude not to talk, but no, it's not about me, you know, and just these little shifts in the way we enter the world, take up space or don't, right? So it has to happen personally and within these systems. And I get how big that is, but I feel like it can happen. Um, do you think large police departments are the place to start to model and trickle down? Or do you think slowly in smaller jurisdictions? How, how do you actually see it rolling it out? Um, I, I mean, look, this is just sort of my gut is I think that it's really police department by police department. There are some um, police departments that already have some community component to them. And I don't know that you can say it should start large or small. I think it just depends on the culture of the department itself. There may be some large cities where the culture is already one of introspection, um, but I don't know. I mean, oh, good. I, I can disagree with you now on this podcast because I, I said I said I don't know. Oh, well, I do know. So. <laughs> I, I want to be at your dinner table. <laughs> no, I, I honestly think you have to start at the more local, smaller level. Okay. Because I think changing a police force the size of New York City or Chicago or any major city is a massive, massive undertaking that will take many years. Yeah. And I think we need to have some examples 
of how this can work uh, and see success uh, in the real world in order to then make the commitment that's going to be necessary to change it on a large scale. So uh, I think Sonia's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I'm sorry. Never, no, I didn't, mean, I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> well, I'm about to correct you, so keep going. <laughs> I, I, I just think that you have, to, you have to start at the smaller police departments. You know, maybe not the six-person police department. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, a, a relatively small suburban police department, right. progressive area where you can get this stuff rolling without a lot of resistance mm -hmm. and see what happens and then use that as, as a model going forward. Because then what you create for the larger cities is then to say, well, that only works in a small town. It will never work here in New York City. Well, they can say they say that now, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, as a resident of New York City, who's very much ready for the change and a different posture and leadership style, I think they preemptively made some changes and money was taken away. And I don't know where it went. And crime is up. And there is unrest and there is not good feelings. And it feels a little precarious. And I'm like, okay, we can't do this haphazardly or as like a, a knee-jerk reaction, this is going to take a long time. So I don't pretend to have the solutions. That's why I ask people like you guys to come on and share your thoughts. Um, but yeah, I like the idea of, of modeling it somewhere and trying it. But as I think for me, like a good faith effort would go a long way. Communication from a department saying they're exploring options and they're examining oh. and studying, that would go a long way for me. Well, yeah, and there are small steps that a large department can take. Don't get me wrong. Yes. You know, what I'm saying is if we're going to really go and, and do some fundamental changes, I think those have to take place in a smaller department first. Now, can there be incremental change in a large department? And should there be? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, we can start small in the large departments. And, and you're right. That's going to then build on itself. Yeah. Uh, so that's important. Well, look, I mean, if, if there's if there's one thing you do in larger cities, like you create real conviction integrity, units, right? Like you, you create a conviction integrity unit in all of the large police departments, an independent functioning unit. I think that kind of oversight begins to affect change in a bigger organization. And I think that if you can start with something like that, maybe there's hope for wholesale change within the department. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it, it's, they're large animals, you know? Yeah, for sure. Um, how many episodes do you think you'll have in this first season? Do you know? You'll have 10 and you're, okay. And you're about at four or five right now? Uh, we've three have, well, the first one was the premiere, which we, we did when George Floyd happened, we said, you know, can't launch abuse we can't power launch abuse of power and not talk about systemic racism. Yeah. But we did that as a special and it's really, it's a different, um, a different model, if you will. Yeah, much uh, more interview style. Well, yep. I think you've listened to that. I did. That's I did. Different than sort of storytelling conversation right. of the others. And right. then the three uh, Tim Bridges, Christine Bunch, and Sedley Alley right. dropped. Right. And then there's, se there's seven more that'll, that'll drop one a week for the next seven weeks. Awesome. Well, I do hope, and I'm, I know people are listening and talking about it. It's so timely. I think you guys are the perfect people to, to share these stories and to tell them. Uh, something I ask my guests before they go is, uh, what is keeping you up at night? So whoever wants to go first. Trump. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I mean, if you want the honest answer, it's the real prospect in my mind that our democracy could come to an end. That keeps me up at night. Um, and that's just the truth. Um, yeah. And I, I said it when he was running. Uh, we, we don't have friends who we used to have, um, you know, because I told them what was going to happen. Uh, and now I see it happening. Uh, and it scares me, you know, not so, you know, for me, you know, I can live with anything for the next few years, but for my daughter and my sons, uh, it's really frightening to me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with that. I mean, look, quite literally, we have a four month old puppy and he does keep me up at night. That's, um, that's, <laughs> That's real. <laughs> yep. Um, and during this pandemic, I will say as a working mom, what keeps me up at night is whether I'm going to be able to keep my head above water with all of the responsibilities I have. Um, but, you know, more broadly and more figuratively, because those things do literally keep me up at night, you know. Um, I, I also worry about what has happened in our country, uh, where we will be 
and whether we'll be able to come to a place of um, racial equity, social equity, peace with each other, have the ability to have real conversations and, and you know, disagree without, um, you know, being uh, torn apart. Yeah. So yeah. those things also really concern me on a regular basis. And, and I often just feel like I need to sort of push that aside to get through the day. You know what I forgot to mention? Beautiful answers. I, I feel all of those deeply. Um, you guys are art lovers. And is art your escape from sort of all this and a shared intro? <laughs> no, 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 you may not. <laughs> you like, oh, oh, no. Is he, is he not an art lover? You know, art gallery, right? You know, I, art I do. I do. So is I'm just wondering if this is like your, your place where you cannot be talking about the state of the world at all times. Well, let's, is, this is what I'll say. I will say that running an art gallery and learning about this whole new world um, has taught me that uh, it is a whole new world. And I had a, a, a learning curve that included like recognizing that this was actually part of the business world and not everybody. <laughs> ethical. So that's been challenging. Um, but what I will also say is I have met and established relationships with incredible artists. And I just love talking to these people about the way they see the world. Yeah. Um, Look, art used to be a great way for us to escape. We'd collect it when we would travel, uh, but now it's kind of... <laughs> well, and here's the other thing that I was going to say. Sonia did not start, you know, buy an art gallery in order to just have an art gallery. She wanted to communicate ideas and, um, and really use it as an extension of everything else that we do in our lives. Yeah. So a lot of her programming has been socially conscious programming. Uh, you know, one of our early shows, uh, you know, was The Art of Struggle, uh, you know, featuring, you know. Uh, you want me to take over here? Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, no, 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 I mean, David's right. That it, the whole goal for me was to address these issues that underlie It wasn't to escape is the point. Yeah, I see, yeah, I it, see. Yeah, and it was, um, I, I really loved being able to bring people together to have these conversations, to use art as the vehicle for dialogue. It's so much easier to be in front of a painting or a sculpture or you know a mixed media piece and talk about something like women's issues or race or immigration than it is sitting in city hall. And um, you know, it's sad that we can't gather now. Yeah. Um, and it's you know it, it it will evolve, and I'm working on being innovative. But it, it wasn't intended to be an escape. It was intended to be a way to address all of these issues in a more broad sense, reach people more broadly. Because, you know, you only change things, I think, when you get outside of the tight-knit community that talks about these things all the time. Mm. So this was kind of getting out of the world of criminal justice to be talking about things like race and, um, and women and uh, all sorts of societal inequities. So it's actually a way to integrate your whole life in a, yeah, in, in just yeah. in a different environment. Yes. yes. Okay. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Understood. Glad we got through that and understand each other. I would love to sit at your dinner table sometime. I think your conversations would be super fun to keep up with. Um, but I thank you both for being on dialogue so much, and um, thanks for killing the small talk, as we say. Yeah. Thank well, no, you. and thank you for having us. Yeah, really. we yeah. really appreciate it. Thanks for killing the small talk. Dialogue is a yellow tape media production edited by Jason Usry and produced and hosted by me, Rebecca Sebastian. Please be sure to subscribe to Dialogue, a true crime conversation, wherever you listen to podcasts and follow us on social media. We are at Dialogue Pod across all platforms. You can also drop me a note or a guest suggestion or sign up for my newsletter at RebeccaSebastian.com. Be sure to join me every Wednesday for a new episode and another killer conversation.